Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about range and endurance, but before I start that, I would like to... Uh, last time I explained gliding flight, and then, uh, as far as I remember, the lecture ended there. So I would like to continue from there and show you some uh, examples. So let me open the uh, our last lecture notes. I think it was this one. Nope, this is for today. Um, so anyway, before uh, even gliding flight, uh, we were talking about time to climb, and the time to climb can be calculated using this differential equation, and by taking the integral of that equation, we can calculate how much time it takes for an aircraft to climb from one altitude to another altitude. Uh, so this, the best way to, do, to perform that integration is to do numerical integration. Okay, and from now on, uh, for range and endurance, we will be uh, faced with similar equations, similar differential equations to be uh, integrated. And for best, most accurate results, uh, the best way to is to uh, take those integrals numerically. Uh, okay, but under very some uh, restrictive assumptions, analytical results can be calculated, which I will uh, talk about. Uh, for example, for time to climb, we use this differential equation, and uh, by arranging that equation, we bring it into this form, and if you just integrate this equation, the left-hand side will give you time to climb, and on the right-hand side, uh, you need to perform this integration over altitude, dh. Uh, so to get the result, uh, you need to have rate of climb values at different altitudes, so you can calculate these values numerically. And then once you have such a uh, numerical data, you can just integrate it. So this is the inverse of that. Okay, so this integ numerical integration is very simple. Uh, you can use the simplest possible integration, which is just to uh, divide this area into small rectangles, right? So uh, I hope you saw, saw this in your computer programming code. But even if you haven't, it's really a very simple procedure. So you assume that this is composed of small rectangles, and you simply add up the areas of these rectangles, okay? And if you divide this entire area into um, small enough rectangles, the result will be very accurate. Okay. Um, after time to climb, uh, I talked about the gliding flight which is very similar to the climbing flight, except that uh, the flight path angle is negative, and also there is no thrust force, okay? So whenever you hear the word glide, it refers to an unpowered flight, so the thrust force is equal to zero. Um, <coughs> so if you are gliding in an equilibrium, that means there are no accelerations, no acceleration in the, the flight path direction, and no acceleration in the, the direction perpendicular to that, uh, then you have these two equations here, and from that equation you get this expression for the flight path angle, the tangent of the flight path angle. Uh, and this angle, the, the tangent of the angle is uh, 1 over L over D. Okay, so the lift to drag ratio, once again, um, we see that in a performance parameter, in a, a performance number. Uh, so, the glide path angle is something you want to be small, okay? So, if you are for uh, both regular aircraft and for gliders. So, if you are uh, faced with a situation where your engines die, you can't get any thrust force, you want to be able to go as far as possible, because in that case, you would be looking for an emergency landing site, okay? So, you're flying an aircraft, you lose your engine power, and then you have to land the aircraft safely, uh, in that uh, case, if you have the ability to travel to a, a long distance, it will be better for you because you will have a greater chance of finding a suitable landing site. Uh, so in that regard, if you want this angle to be as small as possible, that means you will have to make your lift to drag ratio as high as possible. Okay? Um, so for the minimum possible angle, you have to 
find the highest possible lift to drag ratio. Uh, so for that, let's remember our uh, drag polar curve. So this is a typical drag polar curve. Uh, so this is just a curve that shows lift coefficient as a function of the drag coefficient. Or, uh, the, this is the relation between the two. Uh, <coughs> so the, the curve typically looks something like that. And if you are looking for the point where the ratio is maximum, you're looking for this red point here. And that point is the one uh, you obtain as follows. You draw a straight line from the origin that is tangent to this curve, and the point of contact between the two gives you the maximum point. Uh, so you have to find this point. And if you do that, your aircraft will have the minimum possible uh, glide path angle. Uh, so let's, ma let's uh, think about what this actually means. Uh, so your lift to drag ratio has to have a certain value, right? And that means your CL coefficient has to be a fixed number. And your CD coefficient has to be a fixed number as well. And these are those fixed numbers. So your CR coefficient has to be this much, whatever that is, and your CD coefficient has to be that much. Uh, so this dictates your flight condition, right? So if you want to be fly at that particular point, you have to have a certain CR coefficient. That means you have to have a certain speed, right? If you fly at any other speed, then uh, uh, your CR value will change. Um, and remember, this uh, maximum lift to drag point is the point where thrust required becomes the minimum. So if you plot your the, the thrust required values as a function of airspeed, uh, this point corresponds to this point here, the point where the thrust required is minimum. Again, and this happens at a particular speed. So this is V, let me call that V star again. Um, Okay, so at this point, let me draw your attention to um, uh, to a point. Okay, so you, so you, your aircraft starts gliding, and it has to satisfy that equation if you are doing a steady glide. Okay, if you are gliding at a constant uh, speed. Uh, so you, this equation should hold weight times cosine of gamma, and this is equal to one over two times rho times v squared times s times cl. Uh, so for uh, best possible gliding flight, this has to have a certain value, cl, and this is a constant number. Uh, your altitude is something, so for your altitude, you know what the air density is approximately going to be. And from here, you solve the uh, weight square equation, because the left-hand side is a constant number. Uh, but the speed you will get from here depends on the altitude, right? So if you start gliding at 10 km altitude, you, you have to start gliding at uh, the speed that comes out of this equation. But when your aircraft, uh, as your aircraft descends, uh, this value will be changing. The air dance will be getting higher and higher. And as your aircraft descends, uh, if you want to keep the gliding angle at the best possible angle, the speed of the aircraft should change accordingly, right? So it, if at 10 kilometers this is something, uh, when your altitude reduces to 1 kilometer, your speed should change if you want to keep your CL at the best possible um, um, value. So even though we call this a steady glide, for the best possible glide, you have to change this uh, accordingly with changing altitude. But that change is a very small change, and you can still assume that to be a uh, steady glide. Okay, so... Um,
I wish I had a numerical example, but unfortunately I don't. Uh, it will change something like, I don't know, just very few meters per second in, uh, in a relatively long time. And the acceleration corresponding to that will be very close to z uh, zero. Okay, uh, so before proceeding to the range and endurance, let me show you two recent events um, related to the gliding. The first one I would like to show you is this accident. I don't know if you remember that. In the United States, let me see, it was in 2009, I think, right? An aircraft uh, flies into a flock of birds and then the aircraft loses both of its, its engines during climb. And after the aircraft loses engines, uh, he, the aircraft has to glide, right? Because at that point, the engine thrust drops down to zero. Um, so this accident is very related to our the gliding topic. Um, so on this Wikipedia page, you can read about the details about this accident. Uh, so here, this diagram shows what happens. Uh, the, the aircraft takes off from the airport here. So it was going through this route. At this point, I think it hits the birds here. And then, um, so basically the aircraft was left at this point, at this coordinates, and there's a certain altitude, and the altitude values are given here as well. Uh, the aircraft had to glide. Okay, so no, normally the, the first thing the pilots thought about was to go back to the same airport they took off from. And uh, they had to perform a maneuver like that to and go land at the same airport. And uh, it's a very difficult situation because you have very limited time, right? You have to decide very quickly. You cannot uh, sit there and think for, I don't know, half an hour to decide what to do. So you have very limited time and you have to think very quickly. Um, uh, so anyway, they were talking with the, the air traffic control people and finally the captain decided to land the aircraft on the Hudson River and he did that successfully. Uh, so there are some numbers here. Uh, so I think at this point it would be really nice for you to read these related events on the news with an engineering viewpoint. Okay, so now you are learning aircraft performance. Uh, the next time you see such a uh, story on the news, you should look at with an engineering viewpoint and see if you can uh, get any uh, useful information with what is provided. For example, for this aircraft, they, uh, the speed of the aircraft is given. Um, Okay, I think it was here. The, when the aircraft hit the birds, the airplane was at an altitude of this much feet above ground level and a distance of, from the, the runway. And the speed of the aircraft, all these information are given. And from here you can, uh, if you're interested, you can try to get some uh, calculations and see if the pass, for example, could have returned back to the airport. Um, because you know the starting altitude, you know the speed, and from there, if you uh, you can calculate how much distance the aircraft could glide, and see if that was sufficient to go back to the airport. Um, actually, if you read through this uh, page, you will see that it was impossible for the aircraft to go uh, land at at the runway. So it's good that the pilot didn't try to do that; otherwise, it would have crashed before the runway. Um, there's a second incident. This was a very interesting example. Uh, this occurred on 1983. A Canadian aircraft uh, airliner ran out of fuel while flying at uh, 12 km altitude. And the reason for that is very uh, interesting. Um, 
So basically the aircraft ran out of fuel because the fuel loading was miscalculated due to a misunderstanding of the recently adopted metric system. So basically they uh, measured the, the amount of fuel they loaded in pounds, but that uh, somebody else thought it was in kilograms, and because of that they put they didn't put sufficient fuel uh, on the aircraft, and obviously the the uh, the fuel gauge, the fuel sensor was also not working properly. So anyway, the aircraft just lost all its power while flying at 12 kilometer altitude, and at that point it had to glide. Uh, so I really suggest that you read through this story. Uh, but from here we can get some really nice and numerical calculations. Okay, so when they got lost power, so it's a very fortunate that the, the captain of the aircraft was an experienced glider pilot, so he was already familiar with uh, the gliding flight, which came familiar with flying techniques almost never used by commercial pilots. To have the maximum range and therefore the largest choice of possible landing sites, he needed to fly the aircraft at the best glide speed. Now we know that what they are referring to there is uh, this speed, the speed at which the required thrust becomes minimum, which also refers to this point, the speed at which the lift to drag ratio becomes maximum. Um, so the pilot makes his best guess as to this speed for his aircraft and he flew the aircraft at 220 knots which corresponds to 410 kilometers per hour. So he thought that was his best gliding speed. Um, so anyway, uh, the data here given says that the aircraft lost 1.5 kilometers in 19 kilometers, which corresponds to a glide uh, ratio of approximately 12 to 1. Um, okay, so let me uh, define a problem here. So this is a real event, and I can make a question out of this example for the exam. In fact, that's what I'm really planning to do. In the final, I'm planning to prepare a question out of this example. But let's think about that here. Um, the aircraft starts gliding at altitude um, the pilot uh, sets the speed to 410 km per hour and achieves a glide ratio of 2 after 1 so that's what's given in the um, on the Wikipedia page. Uh, so, if the aircraft travels 12 units of distance, it loses 1 unit of altitude. So, this is the flight path angle. So, this gives us that the tangent of that angle is 1 over 12. From here we know that the CL to CD ratio must be equal to 12 during that flight, during that glide. Um, uh, and we know that this angle will be minimum if this ratio is maximum. Uh, so the, the pilot of the aircraft thought that this was the best he could get, but he didn't have the exact numbers uh, at the time. 
So I I made a Google search and on some website somewhere here um, they say that the lift to drag ratio so according to this person I don't know if it's accurate or not but on the Boeing manual it says that for that particular aircraft the, the, the best lift to drag ratio is uh, approximately 18 okay so the um, According to <coughs> a Google search, the best CL to CD <coughs> ratio for this aircraft is approximately 18. So that way it looks like the pilot was not doing the best possible glide, right? <coughs> um, so if this is the drag color of that aircraft, this is CD, this is CL. Uh, so this is the best possible uh, I should call that gamma. Let me call that theta. Theta max is um, inverse tangent of 18. Uh, but uh, that aircraft during that <coughs> flight was flying with a lift drag ratio of 12. Right? So in that incident, the aircraft was flying with <coughs> a lift drag ratio of, let me call this, uh, theta G, G for Gimli. And that theta G was inverse tangent of 12. Uh, so there are two possibilities, right? So the, the pilot was either flying at this point or he was flying at this point. Uh, <coughs> for example, I can ask you which point the aircraft was flying. So with the given information, I think you can uh, answer that. Uh, the speed of the aircraft is given as well, right? It was flying at 410 kilometer per hour. Uh, you can find out the air density at that altitude. Uh, you can also on the internet find the, the reference area, wing surface area for the aircraft. And uh, you can get an approximate value for the weight, because weight is an important parameter in this problem. Uh, <coughs> And using all, all those information, I can create a question out of this. In fact, as I said, I'm planning to do that. Uh, so just think about this problem and see what uh, you can calculate for this aircraft. Anyway, um, do you have any questions? Do you, um, So the reason I'm showing you the, the related problem from actual accidents or actual situations that happened is that I want really you to take a look at these things with an engineering viewpoint. Whenever you see something uh, on the news or you hear about the story, uh, just try to do if you can do some calculation and if you can get some answers. So for in the future, for example, for a situation like that, you can be called for as an expert to explain the situation, right? These things happen to us. Uh, whenever an accident happens, uh, if it's a, there's a legal situation, the, the, the accident goes to court, and the court wants to understand what happened, and they uh, talk to uh, airspace experts. They, sometimes they come to our department, and they say that here's an accident, this is what happened, and tell us, explain us how this might have happened and uh, tell us your opinion about this and you, we, uh, we do this, we analyze this for example, right? we look at this data so this is a very uh, <coughs> good example in fact so the pilot glided with this ratio and you can say that so that was not the best thing the pilot could do, he could have glided better, He could, if he knew that 
the, uh, the best lift to drag ratio was higher, he could have glided for a farther distance. Um, so things like that, you can, as an uh, engineer, you can uh, make these comments. Okay? Uh, so anyway, uh, the, our next topic is range and endurance. Uh, so let's start that now. Uh, first, let me give you the definitions. Range is defined as the total distance with respect to ground. An aircraft can fly on a full tank of fuel, the maximum range. And endurance is related, but it is defined differently. Uh, it is the total time an aircraft can stay in the air on a tank of fuel. So you may think that these should be related, but in certain cases they can be quite uh, different. For example, the maximum range for an aircraft can be, I don't know, 5,000 kilometers. And to achieve that maximum range, the flight takes, uh, uh, I don't know, seven hours, okay? And you can't say that the endurance is seven hours, because the same aircraft can stay in the air for nine hours, under different conditions, but within that nine hours, it can go only to 3,000 kilometer uh, range. Uh, so, do you, do you see the difference? Uh, for maximum range, the important thing is how far you can go. In the endurance, the important thing is how long you can stay in the air. And if staying longer doesn't mean that you will go to farther, because if you are flying slower, um, the distance will be lower. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so without looking at the equations, we can decide, think about what uh, we need or what these uh, parameters depend on. So obviously they, they are related with the engine efficiency, right? So if you have a very efficient engine that burns uh, fuel very efficiently, then you will have better range and better endurance. Uh, they should depend on aerodynamics of the aircraft. If the aircraft has very efficient aerodynamics, that should improve both of these terms. That's what you can intuitively say. Um, obviously, the amount of fuel on the aircraft is very, very important. If you have very small amount of fuel, then your range will be obviously limited. Or if you can add fuel to your aircraft, that will increase the range and endurance as well. Uh, and now we are going to analyze this, um, both of these things uh, uh, quantitatively. Okay, so we are going to find some equations that will give the range and endurance for aircraft. Okay, so to do that, we start with uh, some weight definitions. So there are four different weight terms defined here. Uh, the first one, W0, is called the gross weight of an aircraft, and this includes everything, including the full tank of fuel, payload, structure, crew, engines, everything. So this is the maximum weight uh, of an aircraft that it can ever take. Uh, so it's a constant number, right? So for an airliner, for example, you consider the weight of the empty aircraft, you add full tank of fuel, and then you add all the passengers, all the cargo it can take, and once everything is loaded, whatever the weight uh, you get is your W0 term. Again, it's a constant number. Uh, the second number is WF. This is the weight of the fuel on the aircraft, and it changes during the flight. Uh, so when you start with a full tank of fuel, it is equal to the uh, full capacity of the fuel tanks, uh, but as you fly, you burn fuel, and as you burn fuel, this reduces, okay? And uh, it varies with time since fuel is being consumed during flight. It actually reduces during the flight. Uh, the next term is W sub FB. Uh, the FB stands for fuel burned. Uh, so this is a variable as well. And uh, this is equal to zero at the beginning of the flight. When you first start flying, uh, at the very beginning, uh, you have not burned any fuel yet, so it is equal to zero. But as you fly, this uh, number increases, increases during flight. Uh, the last one is W1, and this is the weight of the aircraft when the fuel tanks are empty. 
So this is uh, this is a constant as well, and it's equal to W0 minus the weight of a full tank of fuel on your aircraft. Uh, so this is the weight of the aircraft with an empty fuel tank. This is the weight with a full fuel tank. And the difference is the amount of fuel, amount of full tank of fuel. Uh, so the weight of full tank of fuel is the constant number, but it is composed of uh, these two parts, fuel uh, weight terms added together. So this is the weight of fuel left in the tank, and this is the weight of fuel burned. Okay? So let's see what it says here. The sum of WF and WFP gives the weight of the full tank of fuel. At the beginning of the flight, WFP is zero. And at the end of the flight, when the aircraft runs out of fuel, WF becomes zero. So in other words, there's uh, this relation here. So you can write this equation and make uh, this plot. Uh, the horizontal axis is time. So the aircraft starts flying. The vertical axis is the weight of the aircraft. So the aircraft starts flying with a weight equal to W0, and as it flies, the weight uh, decreases uh, since the fuel is being burned. And when it comes to the point where no fuel is left in the tank, uh, weight becomes W1. So let me say that this is... Um, time when all the fuel is burned. And at any given time, um, this part gives you WFP, the amount of fuel burned, and this part gives you the amount of fuel left in the tank. Okay, so, so this is the equation that we will use to calculate range and endurance. Okay, so it depends on this amount of fuel burned and amount of fuel left in the tank. Um, so one very important parameter we need to know is uh, the engine efficiency or how much fuel the engine burns to uh, run. Uh, the parameter we use for that purpose is called the specific fuel consumption. It reflects how efficiently the engine converts uh, burn fuel into useful power, a characteristic of the engine. Uh, for a reciprocating engine, it is defined as um, the weight of fuel consumed per unit power per unit time. Uh, so the fuel consumption shows how much fuel is actually burned, but when you say it's specific, uh, you normalize this number with respect to something, and usually it's normalized, um, in this case, it's normalized with respect to the power it produces. So anyway, the specific fuel consumption is uh, defined as follows. The amount of fuel burnt, so this is the time derivative of fuel burnt, uh, divided by the power produced by the engine. So from here you get this relation. The amount of fuel burnt is equal to specific fuel consumption times uh, the power. Um, so this is how you define it if you have a propeller engine, because for propeller, remember, we talk about power always. But if you have a jet aircraft, then uh, everything is specified in terms of thrust. So this is valid for the specific fuel consumption as well. For a jet aircraft, you use a thrust specific fuel consumption, and it is defined as the amount of fuel burnt or the rate of fuel burned, I shouldn't say amount, the rate of fuel burned divided by the thrust produced by the engine. Okay, so we use uh, different specific fuel consumption terms for propeller and jet aircraft. Uh, so above definitions of specific fuel consumption and uh, thrust specific fuel consumption, assume that fuel consumption rate linearly depends on engine power. Um, So that means the ratio of the fuel consumption rate to the power produced or the thrust produced is a constant number, and that constant number is your specific fuel consumption. Um, so, for example, if you want, um, so this is the power produced by the engine, and let's say this is your maximum power. 
right? Um, And this is your maximum PA. Let's say at maximum power, your engine consumes this much fuel. So this is directly kilograms per second, for example. It shows how much fuel is consumed uh, per unit time. And according to that relation, this is, this is linear. So if at maximum power, you are consuming this much fuel, at half power, uh, the amount of fuel consumed will be half of uh, that. So it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, <coughs> uh, obviously, in reality, this is not a perfect linear relation. In reality, uh, as you come close to your maximum performance, your engine will be producing more fuel. So it will be something like this. So the fuel consumption will be increased really uh, uh, faster than this linear relation, but for our calculations we will make this linear assumption because it makes things a lot easier and it's very reasonable in and in a, a in big part of your um, flight. Anyway, um, similarly for a jet aircraft, you have such a linear relation between the created thrust, the available thrust from the engine and the fuel consumption rate. Okay, so uh, the, at any instant during the flight, uh, you can write the weight of the aircraft at that instant uh, using these two relations. You can either say that it is the weight of the empty uh, weight of the aircraft with an empty fuel tank plus the amount of fuel in the tank, or you can write it as the amount of uh, the gross weight of the aircraft. Remember, this includes the full tank of fuel, minus the amount of fuel that is burned uh, up to that point. Okay? Uh, so these two things are equal to each other. Um, okay, so then you can take the derivative of this equation with respect to time. Uh, on the left-hand side, you get this dw over dt term. And on the right-hand side, remember, both W1 and W0 are constant numbers. So differentiating them with respect to time gives you zero. So you get zero here. And uh, the second term is a varying term. So it has a derivative. So you simply call that uh, dWf over dt. Or if you use the second equation, it's going to be minus uh, dWfp over dt. Okay? Uh, so this is your the differential equation. The weight change of the aircraft is equal to uh, change of uh, the rate of change of amount of fuel or the rate of change of fuel burnt, and there's a negative sign between the two. Uh, so if you have a propeller aircraft, and um, for this term WFP you go back to the definition of the uh, specific fuel consumption and use the relation from there. Uh, so for a propeller aircraft, uh, we have this equation that comes from the definition of the specific fuel consumption. So we take this term and put it into the equation. So for propeller aircraft, W dot is equal to minus WFP dot, but WFP dot is equal to C times P. Uh, so if you arrange this equation, you get this equation for a propeller aircraft. Uh, so this is a differential equation. And this is uh, just like what we did in the time to climb calculations. We can now integrate this equation to find... Um, on the left-hand side, we have dt, and integrating dt will give us time, right? So if we start integrating at the beginning of the flight where the fuel tanks were full and do the integration uh, all the way to the point where the fuel tanks are empty, uh, the time that passes between two will be the endurance, okay? So this is the amount of time spent 
uh, while the, the full tank of fuel is consumed. Uh, so the left hand side gives us endurance, and the right hand side is this integral. Uh, the integration is performed over dw weight uh, at the beginning of the flight so remember this dv is the uh, the, the total weight of the aircraft the, the rate of change of total weight of the aircraft so at the beginning so the total weight was w0 and at the end uh, the weight drops down to w1 and if you perform this integral uh, you will find the endurance of the aircraft Okay, uh, so this is the uh, uh, so you have a negative sign here, and the integral is from w zero to w one. And remember, w zero is a greater number; it, it is the gross weight, and w one is the empty weight. Uh, so you can switch the integral limits and get rid of the negative sign here. Uh, so this is what we do here. So the endurance equation becomes. The negative sign is gone, but the limits are changed uh, from uh, W1 to W0. And you integrate this term, this gives you the endurance. Okay? And remember, this, while arriving at this, we didn't make any assumptions in regards to the flight condition. Okay? So we made an assumption that. Um, we basically made this assumption for specific fuel consumption. So we said that this is true for our engine, but other than that, we didn't say the, the flight is steady or the flight is level. We didn't make any of those assumptions. So this is the most general form uh, for endurance. So if you calculate this, so basically, if uh, you uh, we assume this to be a constant number, the specific fuel consumption. So all you need to do is find the power, actual power produced by the engine throughout the entire flight. And if you know that, you can integrate it and uh, whatever you get will give you the endurance. Okay? Okay, so let's give a break here and I will continue with uh, making um, simplified equations out of this for particular flight conditions.